Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The time is now 940 and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of September 11, 2012 is called to order. Um, first item is approval of agenda and order priority. I have a motion, please. Um, I, I think we're requesting a removal of item C and item R. Um, this is one item listed on the first and last page of the agenda. It's approval of criteria for Title IIA statewide technical assistance center grants. We're just not quite ready yet. And we need approval passing item C and R. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Mertz, Ms. Snyder. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to introduce you to the people around the table. To my left is Mike Flanagan, Chairman of the Board and Superintendent of Public Instruction. And as we go around the table to the left, John Austin is the President of the Board. He's from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Cassandra Albrich is the Board's Vice President. And Cassandra's from Rochester Hill. Nancy Danhoff, who's just um, stepped away for a minute, is from East Lansing. She's the Board Secretary. And then we have Kathleen Strauss from Detroit and Bobby Joe Kenyon. Bobby Joe teaches science and math at Ottawa Hills High School and Grand Rapids Public Schools. She is this year's Michigan Teacher of the Year, um, sitting at the table for the first time. Eileen Weiser is in route. She sits across the table. <laughs> <laughs> you always know how to make an entrance, don't you, Eileen? <laughs> There's Eileen Weiser waving to you from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Dan Varner from Detroit, and Richard Siley from Dearborn. Richard is the board's NASB delegate, National Association of State Boards of Education. Next to me is Mary Ann Yara McGuire. Mary Ann is from Detroit. She's the board's treasurer. Thank you. Thank you, Marts. Um, just a few comments before we go to the first item. First of all, uh, I'd like to take special privilege really to um, commend Nancy Danhoff I think for her outstanding service on the State Board of Education and it's uh, I know that the, it, it, the nomination didn't work quite the way that uh, it looked like it might but I think I just wanted to acknowledge I think you've been a great uh, proponent of rigorous standards for our schools and uh, fair accountability the key being fair uh, high quality education for all of our kids and uh, I just think uh, we've worked together before you were in this position that's your husband calling now he's trying to <laughs> um, but I appreciate your passion and advocacy Nance and I know we're going to also lose Mary Ann and we'll have something to say about both of you and, uh, and appreciation of your service in the December meeting but I want to acknowledge that today Nance And one thing, I'll, I'll just say this, the staff, we really appreciate the, the fact that the votes don't have to be unanimous. In fact, it's a good thing if you have debate and, and don't always agree on items. That's healthy. But I, I can't thank all of you enough and certainly see this in Nancy and Mary Ann, the kind of uh, bipartisan spirit and the cordiality and the way that have worked together as a board is really important to us and I think the whole state so we appreciate that very much and then today's Patriot Day and also my daughter the middle school teacher's birthday so she's got that kind of burned in her brain forever and uh, we're all urged to recognize and participate as you know by honoring and celebrating um, so that all may offer the reverence that's due based on 9-11 and the 11th year anniversary of uh, the World Trade Center and the other events. President Obama said even the simplest act of kindness can be a way to honor those we have lost and to help build stronger communities and a more resilient nation. By joining together on this solemn anniversary, let us show that the America's sense of common purpose need not be a fleeting moment but a lasting virtue, not just on one day but every day. And Governor Snyder proclaimed today Michigan Day of Service and Remembrance. He said, on this day, we encourage citizens of the Great Lakes State to honor the victims of September 11 and the many who rose in response to the attacks by engaging in acts of community 
and charitable service. So, acknowledge Patriots Day. And my note says please pause for setup, but it looks like we're we are set up. Okay. And the first item on today's committee of the whole agenda is pres presentation on technology initiatives. This came up from a few board members who um, were interested at our agenda planning a few months ago and we were able to get it packaged and organized for today. And if the presenters would come up to the table, I'd like to introduce them. Um, I'd like to thank, first of all, Anne Marie, where are you? You regularly, I really appreciate your work in getting these things set up. I think this is, Anne Marie, like so many folks that work here at the department, is just a great person, gets things done behind the scenes, and just wanted to acknowledge that today's another example. Um, and DTMB staffs regularly helping us with the technology as we've moved towards this the last year or two. This is an update on initiatives that are integrating technology and evaluating its effectiveness. Presentations, we hope today you'll, you'll be excited to hear about the use of iPads, state superintendent, so-called seat time waivers that I've issued the last few years. Uh, you've heard the terminology flip classrooms and a number of us have been able to visit some of those high schools. And then we've also asked Jamie uh, Fitzpatrick to join us from the Michigan Virtual University because he's been given a special <coughs> kind of assignment by the governor and the legislature to do some work related to evaluations of these kind of programs. Um, by the way, that's why we, we've, we've kind of been clear that we have pilot programs out there and until we really see how they're going to work with our kids, we just don't want to unleash it and appreciate that the legislature found uh, uh, what we think was a more reasonable way to look at some of that rather than just take caps off totally, for example. Um, so with us today are Sally Vaughn, Deputy Superintendent, Linda Ford, Director of Education Improvement and Innovation, Bruce Umstead, our fine state Director of Education Technology, and as I said, Jamie Fitzpatrick, who is President and CEO of Michigan Virtual University. I'm going to turn it over to Sally at this time. So good morning, and as Mike mentioned, uh, the board has been very, very interested in technology and how it's being integrated into the classroom. And so we are going to be able to showcase uh, very briefly, but enough to give you a flavor of some of the great things that are happening out in the field, uh, as Mike mentioned, related to some of the seat time waiver initiatives. And we have had a number of people talk about, well, flip classrooms, that's another way of really changing how the instruction is done in the classroom. So we are very, very pleased to be able to showcase these programs in local districts for you. And I'll just turn this right over to Linda. Thanks, Sally. Um, you will recall that the governor gave a speech calling for any time, any place, any way, any pace kinds of learning. And we know that we can't get there if we don't have technology infused into the classroom and into the learning. It's the only way that we'll be able to honor the need of the student at the time that they need it and the place that they need it. Mobile and web-based technology is going to enable us to do personalized, individualized learning for any child, any place, any time. So we'd like to show you a few things that we have in mind. Mike has a picture of his granddaughter trying to slide pictures on a book which, because she's gotten so accustomed to utilizing at the age of two an iPad and she can't understand why the picture is not changing. Mm -hmm. Our kids are ready. My grandson has been online for years now and he can sometimes solve problems. I have no idea how he got from A to B but he can make it work when I can't. So they're ready. Unfortunately, the next picture shows you a classroom near here um, in a, a school district that you might expect would have more. This is the total amount of technology in that classroom. There are no other computers. There are no iPads or other mobile devices. And you'll note that the overhead looks an awful lot like the one that came into being shortly after I left teaching. So, um, yeah, right, there's the rest of it. And it gets used how? It's kind of like the, weight mach the, the running machine um, in our we homes. Did, we did beat the bowling alleys to that, though. Yes, we did. <laughs> We're a little bit ahead of that. <laughs> But you, there's not enough infrastructure behind the walls and then not enough devices in the classroom side. We need to take a look at how we might share services more, more um, financially uh, correct and, and a way to get at educator capacity 
None of this can happen if we don't spend some time and energy and funds on our teachers so that they're ready. You can't just hand them this technology and say, go. The content has to change because of the ability to use online um, applications and online assessments. And we have to think totally differently in the classroom about what it means to be productive and be engaged in online learning because it's going to look different than me sitting with my class in front of me and hands raised and the usual kinds, even group work. We need some innovative practices to go on. What we'd like to show you today, though, are some places where things are changing. First, before we do that, here's just another picture of our schools and the situation. The Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium is issuing every six months a technology readiness survey that uh, asks the schools to tell us where they stand. It's a voluntary survey. Um, in Michigan, we had 226 LEAs participate at the official close of um, the survey, the first survey, that was 25%. By the time we actually closed it down, we had 30% of our schools um, registering and taking the survey. That may seem low to you. We placed fifth in the nation as far as response rates. And so we, we are leading the way. And thanks to Bruce and to the folks in Smarter Balanced um, workshops and whatnot, we've been able to spread the word. But there's the bad news up there. If you look at on the left-hand chart, you will notice that the kinds of um, software that students are using are three generations old at best. That's what the large blue piece of the pie represents. And if you go to the right-hand side, you'll note that um, the, large, the vast percentage of um, students are utilizing desktop computers. That's old-fashioned technology by today's standards. And so we've got a long ways to go to have the right kinds of technology in front of the kids and in the hands of the teachers. I mentioned that we have some good things going on, as did Sally and Mike, and we do have some Lighthouse <coughs> programs. I would just preface all of this part of the presentation by saying to you, these are only a handful of the many things that are going on across the state, but to suggest that we're ready would be a misnomer. We've got a lot of nice things happening, and Bruce is going to share some of them with you. Hello. The, hi. Hi. Uh, the first program I'd like to talk about is an example of our C10 waiver programs. We have um, close to 200 programs running in the state right now. This is one of them in Wyoming, and it was one of the more innovative ones because they didn't want to just base it on whether or not the student wanted to show up in the building. It was whether or not the student was willing to show responsibility uh, for their, their own learning. And they had a focus on not only helping students that were falling out of their traditional high school, but they also wanted to provide uh, students with a way to actually accelerate. And recently, last year, they had about 80 students in the program, 22 graduated, and of those, five graduated early. So it's not a very large program, but it is a very effective program. The academic achievement measured by the Michigan Merit Exam is on average with the rest of their, of their high school, so the students here are, are not falling behind academically. It, it is giving them flexibility and options, and they're using their own teachers, both as mentors and in certain cases to actually teach the online classes. So it's, it's more of a blended model where some of the classes are online and some of the classes are in the building. Uh, you might call that a hybrid. I know some of the definitions between blended and hybrid and online uh, kind of get confusing. But when a class is taught principally in the building, that is, um, you know, a bricks and mortar, and it's taught online, that's an online class. A hybrid says you'll take some of your classes in the building and some online. A blended is more of a, if you'll take part of the class in the classroom and part of the classes online. What we'll show you today is really a mix of that blend. So we're really talking about blended learning. I have a video. Um, yes. I, I'm sorry. I, can you be a little more um, articulate about uh, the difference between a hybrid and blended? Because I thought I heard you say the same thing for both. Yes, and it, it, it gets confusing. And there is a there is a report that we can provide you by Intersight. Um, it's called the Rise of Blended uh, Blended Learning. It's a K-12 blended learning, I think it's called. It was done by the same group that published the book, uh, Disrupting Class. And it, it provides you kind of with a, a, a spectrum or continuum of what, you know, from fully bricks and mortar in the classroom, no digital content, to fully online. And it'll help you walk through it. So there's... Okay, so the answer is... It's I want to explain. Oh, okay. So uh, hybrid, what we call hybrid, is there are certain classes that the students take physically in the building bricks and mortar 
they might have access to some of the content online, but they have to show up to get the credit. Okay. Then there's online, and they don't come in at all. Maybe they have an online mentor that they might meet with in the building, but principally the entire <coughs> instruction is online. A hybrid is when you mix those and say, you take these two or three classes in your building, and you take these two or three classes online. So maybe you meant to say blended, because you said hybrid twice right. now. Blended right. the first time. So right. which, which, is, which is blended? Okay, blended would be you have one class, and part of the instruction is in the classroom, and part of it is online. Okay. So same class, okay. but there's a blend between 100% in either direction. Thank you. John, to help me understand, what is what are we doing differently that requires a seat time waiver? Okay. So can you explain yes. what they're so getting out of? The law currently allows students to take up to two courses per marking period online. So you can do a hybrid um, without a seat time waiver. So they could take, let's say, in the sixth block, um, six credits in the building and two online arranged. And that has been the case before we allowed for seat time waivers. What a seat time waiver does is allow a student to take more than two courses online. So in a hybrid model, they could take three in the building or three online. In a fully online model, in most cyber schools and uh, seat time waiver programs offer this, the student doesn't have to come into the building at all. They can take 100% of their learning online. We do have some constructs around or limitations around how many students can take 100% of their learning online. We, we've been very flexible with a, what we call a blended approach or a hybrid approach. You can use those terms sometimes are interchangeable, where they can take up to 50% of their seat time online. And we allow 100% of students grades 6 through 12 in any school that signs up for that seat time waiver to take classes in that way. I think the, the goal on our part anyway is that to match the ENEs, which I know we appropriately give the governor credit for getting it in his address, of course, the board had worked through a lot of these concepts and presented them to the governor, and he was good enough to accept them as a way that we think the future sees, that we see the future anytime, any place. We hope at some point that this gets, when it's fully proven and we understand the consequences of the student achievement, that this gets codified in a way that allows the flexibility to be at a district level, the accountability to be there, but they make the decisions and not look for a seat time waiver. I mean, right now we're kind of at that point in history where we've got a foot in two worlds. And until we understand, I mean, I'll give you the most extreme example in my mind right now. We gave limited pilot programs for K-5 online. Frankly, one reason we did is it was already opened in the legislation through the cyber cap. So we thought, kind of to complement that, that we would do some, but we would do it in a way that we would be sure we could measure and see what that means. Because I'll tell you, as someone who, as you know, proposed the seat time waivers and that we started with a number of years ago, I'm still not sure what kindergarten full-time online means. And I just, to me, I, I need more time to understand that. And this isn't to say there isn't a place for it. And there are some kids already involved in that. But ours is done, for example, through a few pilot programs that we initiated this year to kind of try to understand what that is. And then I hope that's what will also happen with the ones that are doing it based on the, the, uh, the cyber cap being uh, partially lifted, that I hope they're measuring it in a way to understand what's the impact on this for kids. Because, I mean, this is old school in my head a little bit, but I still, in spite of Ella, as Linda mentioned, doing this on books because of her facility with iPads, I still, for her as my granddaughter, I envision her having social experiences at school that I'm, I'm still not clear how it would work to not have some of that. Yes, sir. We need to bear in mind the Marshall McLuhan insight that the media <coughs> is the message. Stuff that's delivered via digital technology is necessarily different than face-to-face -face kinds of learning. And that offers strengths for digital learning in some areas, but it also lacks. So I, I think we need to bear this in mind because when we talk about technology, the word technology is, a, is, based, is too vague. I can't teach without tools. Well, what tools are we talking about? I can't teach without technology. What technology are we talking about? And I'm, I guess I'm sometimes a little frustrated because we don't get to that, that real specificity. Now, uh, computer adaptive testing, that's uh, 
clearly an advantage uh, offer. That offers clear advantages, but a lot of this other stuff is, you know, I don't, I don't see any particular advantage to, to the digital emphasis that we've seen. Well, that's part of what, you know, that, that'll raise some questions today that I think and there's a little more specificity in what's going to be presented today. And then, and then I think to your point, that's one reason we want to measure these over time. And, and when the board and the department joined in trying to make sure that the cap on cyber schools wasn't removed entirely, it was partially with this kind of caution of what does that mean and what's the impact really and let's do this over time to understand it. I think, I'm not just saying this because he's sitting here, because I've complimented Jamie before at this table, but I think we have a head start over some states because of things that MVU has done for quite a long time now and is seen as a national leader. Kathy? Well, I don't think there's a time to, to ask Please. Uh, several years ago now, I guess, uh, we visited uh, Westwood program, and I thought that was really good because it involved mentors and mentors for the mentors so mm -hmm. that every, every student had a mentor and the mentors had subject specialist mentors. So I don't know, they didn't call them that, they called them something else. But do we have any, are there any requirements that we have, when you get to this, uh, requirements that, would, that there be teachers involved, that it's not just online, that there, there could be contact with teachers? Both the law. Both the law on uh, the number of uh, what are called self-scheduled or online courses require uh, a highly qualified teacher uh, to be um, the mentor. And in our seat time waiver guidance that we've we've published, we've required there to be a highly qualified teacher as the mentor. And during count day, we actually measure the interactions of the student. Um, both online and also between two-way interactive between the mentor and the, and the student. Actually, a, a weekly requirement at a minimum um, for that interaction to be measured and reported uh, when the auditor actually looks at who's taking the seat time. Well, Bruce, why don't you proceed and then we'll get more. Did you have something, Eileen? I'm sorry. Oh, that's because we're going to start the video. It's pretty much been the best thing that's happened to me in high school. In my high school, I'm 16 and I'm graduating a year early. I mean, what can be better than that? You graduate at 16, most kids don't graduate until they're 18. Frontiers has been a big impact on my academic success, actually. Um, coming into this program, I have a medical condition in which I would probably not have graduated if I haven't done this. Um, I went from having a 1.6 GPA to a 2.68 right now. If it weren't for this program, I would not have made it. I got to finish classes quicker and I got to understand it more than what I have in traditional classes. I have more control in just a few voices from the students that are actually benefiting from our seat time waivers. Uh, again, the program at Wyoming has been successful in helping kids, actually, students graduate. Um, and I just want to share you, with you some of the data. Um, we have, <coughs> we had two originally apply for a seat time waiver. Uh, we grew to 22 when Mike provided a statewide waiver. Um, that waiver grew to 143 districts actually using the waiver with 400 signing plus actually signing up for them. So when you see the 68 waivers from last year, those are individual waivers to either ISDs, consortiums, or including the um, statewide waiver. And that statewide waiver had about 143 districts take advantage of that last year. So while we're managing on an individual seat time waiver application basis, uh, many, many more schools are able to take advantage of this as well. We should have better data coming out next year. The legislature has included pretty significant um, reporting requirements on both online learning, uh, seat time waivers, and cyber schools. And we should be collecting that data starting this, this, calendar, or this school year. <coughs> for clarity, I'm sorry. Please. Um, for clarity, would it be fair to say that the reason that you have something more are taking advantage than using it's because of schools of choice, so that 
did people from other districts, is that how you get from 143 to 400 plus? I, I think I think the 400 plus is like let's get the waiver in case somebody comes to us and says they want to take it online. I, I actually have. Um, oh, all right. So this is right. just permission. Permission. This is an actual use of it yet. The there was 143 of those 400 plus that actually used it, yeah. and so yes, they they fill out the waiver application through the state the, the statewide waiver. So if a student approaches them and says, "I would like to take my classes online," they can they can have that. I I actually know somebody in the Bath school system, and a student was um, expelled. And the parents knew me, so they knew about seat time waivers, and I explained it. And they, he was the first student through the program for Bath um, in terms of uh, taking all their classes online, so he would not lose a year because of the expulsion. And, and that's really the one and two. That's what the statewide waiver is for. The 68 are the ones that craft their own program, like Wyoming Public Schools. They craft their own program and staff it themselves, and so and they use their own teachers. So that's really what the 68 represent. Thank you for clarifying. And Bruce, is Wyoming the one, and feel free to correct me if I am got this mixed up, the one that had, this was the evolution of an alternative academy, in effect, for kids who weren't kind of making it in a traditional classroom and then evolved into this project. Yes, and they, but they wanted to have it right there at their high school, yeah. so they didn't have to have it off-site like an alternative ed program. They wanted to have it as an alternative route within their traditional model. Yeah, I visited that one, and I think you might... Uh, enjoy that and understand it by sitting there because what to me this was an inspiration early on because you could see with no malice I think I'll say it myself when I was a, a local superintendent we had an alternative high school we meant well but I think in some ways it became a holding place um, and kids were over there and it was a place to put them and they were possibly disruptive and I've told you my story I was kind of an alternative ed kid myself so I think this is really, I don't, want to, I don't want to demean the traditional alternative high schools. They've grown a lot in the last 20 years since I was a local soup. But I'm saying this adds one other dimension to it that for some kids they thrive in, in this environment and they weren't in the traditional alternative high school. And many of those are doing a great job without the technology, by the way, so I, need, I want to say that correctly. But it just it meets kids' needs at different places. We wanted to share with you another um, high school that's getting a lot of a lot of attention uh, for a while for, for not so positive purposes, and, and I think that they'll start to get more attention because uh, they have had positive results. It's called the Flipped High School. It's Clintondale Public <coughs> High School in uh, in Macomb. Uh, this this program uh, caught on because the the principal really started looking and disaggregating the data and starting to see. Uh, some of the challenges his students uh, faced. This is one of the only high schools in Macomb that actually does schools of choice through ninth grade. So they actually accept freshmen from other uh, districts. The video I'd like to show you actually talks specifically about one of those students. <coughs> Fifty-two percent of your students, one in every two students, fail your your English, math, and science class, and even even twenty-eight percent is too high for social studies. My name is Greg Green, and I am Clinton High School's principal and curriculum coordinator for grade six and four. When we evaluated our failure rate last year from our freshmen, we found that in English language arts, our freshmen were failing at fifty-two percent rate. And in mathematics, you're failing at a 44% rate, uh, science, and 41% rate, and then uh, social studies at 28%. And, and as a principal, it's, it's just impossible to have that going on in your data. To continue doing the same thing and think you're going to get this different result is, isn't going to work. So uh, we sat down and we said, we got to try something different. Last time, you know, was probably the most crucial time that we had with students. We decided to flip it and, and try spending more time working with the students in class and having them get the lecture and the lessons at home. This allows us to get more one-on-one -on -one time with them. You know, I'm not speaking to a mass group. I had them homework done there within class. We kind of group up the time that students 
and the teachers actually work together in, in you know, going over and learning the information. Uh, my name is Mike Warren Wright. Yeah, I came here when I was in eighth grade, you know, coming from Detroit Public Schools, you know, it's real different. Why did you come from Detroit? Last, last year, Mike Kwan was a freshman in, in the class, and he was struggling, and uh, he'd have a problem, and say problem number one was difficult for him. He couldn't do it at home, so he would give up. So his, all of his homework was, was empty, was blank. Well, now I'm sitting there. I can see his frustration. I can go help him. I can get him past number one. Now he can do two, three, four, five. He's got trouble with problem number six again. I can help him. Um, well, but the biggest surprise is, is the results. When we did go to the flip model, um, you know, we had no fail. I have, there's a kid now, unfortunately, he doesn't go here anymore because, you know, he just was that far behind. He had to go to an alternative high school. But it was the only class he passed here in the high school. So here's another word, flipped. What does flipped mean? It means recording, pre-recording your content and putting it up on the web, mostly on YouTube and some other um, other sources for uh, online delivery so the students could actually watch their lecture at home and then um, what Greg was trying to do is increase the amount of time the teachers had on task in helping answer the questions that were assigned that would accompany the lecture or the reading. Um, he faced significant challenges because he did not have enough technology in the building and this is a traditional bricks and mortar operation. It really was just uh, turning that lecture into digital content and moving it moving it online. The students didn't have enough uh, devices, so actually in, in many cases the teachers were playing their video at the beginning of the class and using that time to actually do all the administrative work. So again, the whole focus was to maximize the amount of time the teacher had teaching the students. And it's a traditional model where they're moving from class to class every 50 or 60 minutes, so uh, it's, they don't need a seat time waiver for this program. They do need more technology. Um, but the good news is uh, Clintondale High School is no longer a priority school. They were able to use this implementation to really drive up their scores. He shared with you the failure rates. He, uh, last week he shared with me the success rates. You can see in reading and math significant <coughs> gains um, over previous years before um, the flip was put in place. Uh, science, writing, social studies also seeing increases. Um, big increase in graduation rate, uh, significant decline in discipline, reported discipline issues, and attendance has, has climbed to 90 percent. <coughs> and just a reminder that with the new terminology, priority schools, which is the appropriate terminology, used to be the persistently lost achieving schools. So that they pulled themselves out of that uh, with Deb and others' help, by the way. So at, 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 and Linda certainly. I think we're. We should be really proud of a lot of this stuff, and in a way, this is our show-off time. So when you brought it up at agenda planning, we went back and went like this, <laughs> because I think uh, this is an area where the department has led, and then in cases like this, has helped schools find other alternatives to get them off, uh, off of their lack of achievement for kids. This is a great example. I visited this one. Too. Was this uh, in one year? <laughs> They've been doing it over two years. Two years. So this, these increases was over two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But still. Bobby Joe, did you have? That was the same question. Yeah. I mean, this is the type of learning when you see <coughs> Khan Academy on 60 Minutes. This is the type of uh, learning. He started to adopt the term uh, flipped and blended learning to try to fit into, you know, mainstream public education and get schools to adopt their content. Uh, Greg and his team were just the first to do it uh, high school wide. But it doesn't have to be at the high school level. We actually have seen uh, great improvement in student achievement and student outcomes as early as kindergarten. So when Mike asks, um, can uh, education um, be impacted at the earliest levels using educational technology, the answer is yes. And in this part of the presentation, we'll show you how in second grade, um, technology was able to help move um, students forward. A little bit of background, um, these two teachers Amber Kowatch um, in the upper right hand corner, the second grade teacher, and Ashley Sharon, the kindergarten teacher, actually volunteered for a small pilot uh, with leftover Title IID funds. I don't know if you're aware, but Congress eliminated dedicated technology funding back in 2009-10. And this was some leftover funds and a grant for Project Reimagine. And the tech director asked if he could give um, 60 iPads to two teachers 
no one else was trying um, one to one at such an early level so we wanted to see what it looked like uh, by the second year we were really enthralled with what was going on in the classroom because we really started to see professionalized uh, per personalized individualized effective instruction and so we actually started a documentary film process which is coming uh, to its close here uh, this fall where we're actually able to capture the different types of learning that's happening in the classroom so yes the students are on the device um, all day if they want um, if they read better using a book you can see one of the pictures um, has the student reading out of the book or maybe a mixed method where he's pulling down his spelling words and writing them out because writing them out is the best way for him to learn how to how to spell What we saw um, on the MEEP, actually, in the second grade classroom, we measured bef the, the same teacher in second grade without iPads to the um, same student with iPads. This is in the first year of implementation. And she saw her performance climb 6% in math and 16% in reading. 16% 16? 16 in reading. Now, to be fair, her elementary school was a high-performing district in their region. So this helped the teacher gain ground um, on her other on her on her peers and she, she kind of pulled even but you can see from the chart um, there's a downward trend at the district level um, there's an upward trend at the state level but significant gains over the state average and similar in reading as well Eileen please I just wanted to ask a quick question from sort of a name Pat um, we talked before about the fact that there was no assessment done on whether instructional uh, characteristics in the classroom changed and, and do you know anecdotally at all whether there was a shift? One hundred percent. So a shift in thinking or in? We were there on the first day of class last year, and I was standing in the hallway not to disrupt, and the film crew was filming, and the students after lunchtime came in, and their new machines were sitting out. They were two-year-old machines, but to them they were new. They're sitting on their desks, and all the teacher said is, "This is the home button." You look across the hall, and all the teacher, all the students were gathering again on on the carpet for teacher time. The teacher was sitting in the rocking chair, and it was time to dispense knowledge. As they move through the year, the student takes more and more responsibility. So yes, the total we wouldn't be doing a documentary if the instructional model was leave the iPads in the back of the classroom. Now it's time to get them out. It's you know it's another activity. Like, it, like they treat textbooks these days. No, this is about um, a total change in the model of instruction. And yes, at the earliest ages in public education. But the curriculum stays the same. The curriculum is the same, same standards. In fact, what they're able to do, they take online assessments, both regional and local assessments, on the iPad. The teacher has the data back the minute they hit submit. So there's real-time uh, instructional data. That was another project we ran called Regional Data Initiatives that actually provided teachers with the feedback as soon as the, the students finished. And actually, in the second grade classroom, they pull the data up anonymous. There's no names, but they look at the charts on who's red, you know, yellow, green. They kind of use um, the stoplight method and say, why do you think there were three or four people in the red area? Why do you think we had so many people in the green area? And so the, the students are actually looking at their data on a regular, frequent basis. And um, we <coughs> were able to play the documentary film trailer um, at the Governor's Education Summit, but many of you um, might want to see it again. So I can play most of it. It's a little bit long, but uh, we will share it with you right now. See is the lakefront and the waterfront homes and the condominiums and all of that. Uh, but the reality is we're about 55% free and reduced lunch. Do we have uh, parents who are out buying laptops for their children? No. Uh, in fact, we're having a hard time buying football shoes or soccer cleats for the students that are on those deals. And uh, do we have band uniforms that are new? No, they're 20 years old. The biggest difference in having iPads or not having iPads is at the end of the day, all of my students want to be here learning. They absolutely love coming to school because they have fun learning and they, they look at learning in a completely different way and it's really powerful. They love it. If you can get your class to love learning, you've already won the battle. How can you be 
a good educator if you're scared to try something new. I think things change so much in the education field that you have to be willing to try new things and you have to be willing to fail and you have to be willing to succeed but with technology in my opinion you can always succeed because this is how kids are learning these days. You take a lot of these challenges declining state budgets, uh, retiring teachers and, and problems finding teachers with the right skill set as well as the need for much higher outcomes and you say what changes this equation? What's the force multiplier for a teacher? And technology is. Now there's an additional factor added and the additional factor is that the, price, the technology is vastly improving and the prices are dropping. Can you write down how many more there are? How many more yellows are there than reds? Flip it up and show me. Look, I wrote it. Excellent! Everyone got the right answer. She just typed the note, send it to each one of our iPads in Dropbox, go home, get on Dropbox, find the note, give it to our mom and dad, they read it, that's that. We took our iPad home and we um, we got to show our brothers and our sisters. I'm going to show my wiki off, I'm going to show my password, my username, and I am going to show off all my tricks. Word got back that they were bringing them home, you know, and, and that's when my husband and I said, okay, we're going to take an active stance here. We are not in favor of this um, and started really attending all of the get-togethers and what was happening. Um, and, you know, what was such a negative thing, I mean, you have, to, you have to experience it to appreciate it. And even then, you still don't appreciate it. It's, it's the most amazing teaching concept piece of equipment, whatever you want to call it, it, I mean, it is going to be life-changing for the kids in the 21st century. It, it absolutely, schools have got to have this. I don't even know how to express that enough. It, it's our obligation, I think, as a society to um, bridge the gap in technology between kids that have the money to do it and kids that don't have the money to do it. And we've got to get this technology into their hands. And if you can start them at a kindergarten level, having that technology, you know, that's, that's, they're going to be all the further ahead when they hit the 21st century. For the, the uh, millions of dollars that school districts spend every year on textbooks, well, now those need to be replaced by digital content. The uh, millions of dollars that states spend every year on administering assessments can greatly be reduced by online assessments. And incidentally, when you do an online assessment, the teacher gets immediate feedback, immediate return on that. So you don't have to go in any order? Like, yeah, you do. You, you have to go, like, if you're going, like, from takeaway, you have to go from highest to lowest. But if you're going, if you're adding, then you have to go up instead of down. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is about another minute and a half. It's a little bit long. In fact, many people think that this is the actual film. <laughs> that uh, we're, we're producing, but it's, it's not. Uh, we are producing a, about an hour long video. Uh, Mike's provided some interview uh, copy for our um, expert commentary. We've been very successful in adding a couple other locations to kind of give us some diversity on both technology, but also um, we're, we'll be filming at a 90-90 a school, 90% free and reduced lunch, 90% minority, just to kind of show how this uh, technology can impact um, all students at an elementary age and we have focused mostly on elementary because it is so provocative it's it's revolutionary it's, you expect this at the high school level and you don't really expect it at the elementary school level Nancy um, I'm not quite sure how to frame this but the school that I'm in the schools that I'm in right now most of them elementary schools have real rigid rules about not having technology on during the day. And in fact, they have places where kids can put them, safe boxes, all kinds of things. And then when you're done for the day, you can pick it up on your way out the door. I don't know whether these districts had that initially or not, but can you just comment on <coughs> the, different, the culture change when technology is allowed versus not allowed? And, and I don't mean just what's going on in the classroom, but my guess is 
these kids if they have cell phones and things they're they're not disallowed now either is that true or not well we are capturing the culture change because these were the only students in Ludington public schools Ludington area school district that had one-to-one -one devices both the elementaries that we are filming at did not have computer labs the media center had five computers in one of the buildings the other one didn't have that many now that they started to scramble and you know scrape up extra money and the superintendent and the school board were actually um, pressed into going for a bond initiative um, to provide every student in that district with a one-to-one -one device because of the work the teacher did but what you're specifically talking about is a cultural change and that has really um, held back the the yeah. adoption and embrace of, of technology but for sure. What I'm asking is personal technology, <coughs> personal technology. Has that now all, has that has that culture shift also become prevalent there as well? In other words, do, even though they have iPads assigned to each of these kids, do they still have to take their cell phones and game boys and everything else and put them in a box when they come in the door and not have them before they end? Or are they kind of seeing wow, there's some ways I could use this too. He's got one. Let's figure out what we can do with it. That, that's called bring your own device, and it is very another provocative and big big debate. We, we might even have it here at the department. We might. <laughs> um, how do you take advantage of the technology that students have and that are bringing in the classroom? Right. And my daughter is actually in a bring your own technology initiative, and it's, it's hard. You, I get to see it firsthand going from 7th to 8th grade who embraces using the technology in the classroom. She started to bring an iPad versus the, the recommended netbook um, because they weren't using the netbook. But because it's a bring your own device, they, the teachers couldn't necessarily restrict her bringing the iPad. In most of her classes, she was putting it under her seat, though in 7th grade and 8th grade, it looks like they're a little bit more open to her using that on a regular basis. I think a place where we've noticed a change would be in Clintondale, for instance, where because the students are looking at this work at home normally, they're then bringing in their iPhones, their whatever they have in their repertoire, and you'll see them being able to use those in the classroom as they're working with their teachers because the lecture is there. And so no longer in Clintondale is it a rigid, thou shalt not turn on your iPhone, <coughs> or turn on your cell phone, turn on any advice device bring it with you and maybe you'll be able to utilize it and and so we're seeing it in some places it and it's beginning to be more and more pervasive where they've already embraced the notion of the technology that's part of that evolution that we think has to happen and in a fairly quick manner and you know I think Nance to continue on your question what one of the things that will blow this wide open is as the technology is getting cheaper and smaller it's already in eyeglasses it's just fairly expensive so when you get to a point where you don't even know that the child has internet in their eyeglass or ultimately their contact lens and can pull up stuff it, it has impacts on our testing it has impacts on what you think you can control that you really can't control anyway so we're, we're right around the corner from I think the debate ending to some degree just because you can't control what you can't control. I think one of the things that I've long um, theorized that no data to prove it. If you help <coughs> people use whatever tools they have, whether it's the basic wheel <laughs> or the internet technology that we now have available to us in, in small bits and pieces, if you help children use, you know, learn how to use it so that it's helpful to them, as opposed to telling them you're not supposed to have that, that you'll, I, I've long term thought that you would really engage more kids in, in the learning process. I, I, I think of the young man in the school that I've been in for several years now who actually was appalled at the behavior in the classroom and videoed it with his, with his phone and was reprimanded for having it on as opposed to when I looked at it, I was amazed at what I was learning about classroom management. And so to me, if we can make that shift, then all kinds of possibilities come forward. So I just wondered if that's what you were seeing tonight. Thank we're, you for your comments. We are going to start to see it. We, we lack some policy initiatives here in the state oh, that say that like Ohio might have. In Ohio, they have a, a facilities fund and a facilities group, and they're recommending one-to-one -one connectivity for all elementary schools, two devices per student at the middle school, and three devices per student at the at the high school level and they're building their infrastructure to, to meet that need three to one at the high school in Ohio high schools in Ohio and, and Nance and the board can I mention this is why I think there's a little tension at least with me to some degree that I I, I don't want to own but I guess I do own from the deans at times in the schools of ed 
it's because this is changing so rapidly. And look at these two teachers from Ludington. Uh, from, the, from the look, anyway, they're relatively young teachers, so they've been in a program relatively recently. And at what point, you know, it was great to see Western Michigan's <coughs> president yesterday. I don't remember if this was a personal email or if this was in, the, it must have been in the news since you're not, nodding, but since Dan's nodding, but to step up and say, we're going to revolutionize the way we're doing teacher ed because it's all moving too quickly. So you've got a student for four or five years, and before you know it, they just haven't had some of the exposure that you're seeing in some of these examples today. So it's not with, it's actually such a big challenge. The ones that are making movement, we want to compliment and thank. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, at a time like this, it can feel like a criticism of those that are finding that hard to do. It's, easy, it's, it's easier to say than to do. Um, I, Kath, and then, and then we're going to go to the... Bring your own device. Bring your own devices. What if they don't have them? Well, there's still kids that don't have iPads. Yep. There, there are a number. Some people might not be able to buy them. Well, you know, Kath, one of the. Depending on. Go ahead. Bringing their own one of the one of the one of the things that you heard in the in one of the videos is if you if we look at the amount spent on textbooks. Oh, I agree with that. And rethink the cost of individual devices. I don't think we're far away from a time when that transition with content that can be updated regularly that we can actually provide it. And then there's a point I hope in our in our study, in our finance discussion as a board department team that we get on the table, is it time for an investment on the part of the state in some major way in order to accelerate this? The worst case scenario, though, is, is the economies of scale are driving so dramatically to the handheld device. Because, this, you know, the iPads today, it'll be antiquated mm -hmm. soon and we'll be looking at something else. And so I, I but I, I have a lot of hope because it, we probably should get that. I, I think there's a way to quantify, Carol probably would know <coughs> better than I, but there's a way to quantify <coughs> what we spend per year as yes. 4,000 schools on textbooks and how quickly we should be able to start shifting that large, large expenditure to providing each kid with something so it doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor. Eileen, please. Just a quick comment. Uh, at Matinga Regatta's last meeting when she made her technology presentation to us, she was a high school teacher, uh, she, she commented on the fact that all of her kids said that they didn't have connectivity at home, so she went on Facebook, found them all, <coughs> and they all had something. Uh, it could have just been a rudimentary um, uh, uh, phone that had connectivity. And the only way she could do it, because there was a there was a computer lab only in her school, there wasn't any, uh, there weren't laptops, I mean, they couldn't take them out of the lab, was to have the kids bring whatever devices they had and, sh and pool, go into teams if there were only five that day, they, you know, they break up into teams of four or five feet. The point I'm trying to make isn't that that's where we want to go. That's where it was uh, two years ago, or two and a half years ago. So if we don't match the technology the kids are seeing and using outside the classroom, and that's a perfect that. entree to Matinga happens to be here. Matinga, yeah. why don't you stand up and we'll say hi to you again. You, <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? I think that was totally innocent. <laughs> well, the good, okay. the good news yeah, the good news is the price is coming down. Um, the iPad prices are actually coming down because of the new iPad. And then uh, new entrants will come into the market from Samsung and Microsoft and some others. Google have just announced tablets. So we're going to see a lot more um, technology that it priced to come into the classroom. The trick will be capacity. And we've been working on a program we call 54321, and Linda's going to, oh, do you want me to handle this? Um, the, how do you operationalize? How do you implement any time, any place? any way, any pace learning. And the first thing we have to look at, and we kind of count down because it's a launch. It's, it's not really a build up, it's a launch. Um, we need to make sure we have enough internet and mobile devices for students in schools. I mean, that right now, we don't have that. And so we have to look for, um, we have to look for ways to kind of accomplish that first and foremost. You really can't do any time, any place if the students have to get in line to access a computer lab. If, if you think about, every student with a device, then you're going to have problems providing technology support and data services for every student 
in our current situation where every district is doing their own thing. So we need to look for ways to consolidate those services on a regional level. Number three is educator capacity. I already experienced it in my daughter's classroom. If the teachers are not comfortable teaching with technology, the device goes under the desk. So we have to increase teachers' <coughs> capacity to use those, that technology and also use real-time data because now they have it at their fingertips. We need to keep pushing for digital learning resources and making them more pervasive and more affordable for every district. And then we have to have online on-demand on tests. The Smarter Balance Assessment in the, in the MEEP that is coming in 2014-15 will help and will lead the way. It will serve as propulsion. But there needs to be more regional and, and local summative assessments so that teachers have that real-time data. And ultimately, we're still looking for those opportunities, and that's what we spotlighted today, those innovative teaching practices that work. I, I, I heard the comment, it, it resonates loud and clear, there's no evidence that education technology has impact. And that's why we're making a documentary film and that's why we're highlighting programs that are starting to capture the data that show that technology does increase student achievement because of the engagement factor at a minimum, but we also think it exposes them to a broader range of content as well. And that's a great segue into the need for research that shows that it's effective. And let's turn it over to Jamie from Michigan Virtual University. Thank you, Sally. Um, I want to cover three things in my presentation this morning. One, I want to um, give just a little bit of a historical <coughs> perspective about the roles that Michigan Virtual has played. Uh, two, I want to provide an update that highlights some of the new and expanded roles that the legislature and the governor have directed us to do and engage in. And then three, uh, provide a brief update on the work that we're doing on behalf of the administration. They made a request to us this spring to engage in a, uh, a planning project. So this first slide highlights three very <coughs> unique and separate roles that MVU has played the last dozen years or so that we've been working with the K-12 community. And the first one was pretty obvious. We started playing the role of a change agent. I'm reminded back in, in 99 or 2000, I think we started out with 100 online advanced placement scholarships that we made available to Michigan schools. And giving those scholarships away was a begging process. We, we literally were begging school administrators. And it was just an unknown foreign uh, delivery model that people were not familiar with. And, and obviously, a lot has changed in the last dozen years. That evolved into that second role that you see in the blue uh, arrow really a service provider role. Uh, this year we worked with nearly 500 Michigan schools. We provided more than 20,000 online course enrollments for middle school and high school students. And then the 30 role, third role that's been evolving is one that we've coined a capacity builder. And we have more and more schools that are looking to us to help, I'll, I'll, I'll equate it to teaching them how to fish. Um, we, in any given term or semester, we use about 150 online contract and instructors that are scattered all over the state of Michigan. But we've provided some professional development opportunity for probably close to 1,000 Michigan educators, introducing them to the world of online and blended learning. So I'm going to highlight, and I've done this in a grouping of three areas, and I've got a, a, a slide on each one of, of these that you see up here. Uh, the rewrite of the School Aid Act identified some new and expanded roles for MVU. The first is to support and accelerate innovation. The second is to create the Center for Online Learning Research and Innovation. And the third is to expand our role with leadership in the area of online and blended learning. So let me touch on the first area of support and accelerate innovation. And I won't read these to you. This is not um, the, the complete list that's in the boilerplate, but it's uh, illustrative of the things that are falling under the category of supporting and accelerating innovation. You see the first one there, a continual effort for us to kind of test, evaluate, and recommend new instructional tools. It, it is a moving target. The technology, and I just heard to now that we're going to see a new uh, release tomorrow or later this week. The technology is evolving. It's becoming easier to use. Uh, it's becoming more intuitive and human-like in its interaction with us as machines. The power is uh, yet to be fully realized. We're still learning. We're really in our infancy, not just us as an organization, but everyone in education and trying to figure out how do we truly harness the power of technology. A look at item C there. That's a huge item. This analyzed the effectiveness of online delivery models. Um, there's a fair amount of research that's out there in the world of online learning. Unfortunately, most of the research is geared towards college-going population. Not as much research has been done at the K-12 population. So we're very fortunate to be given an opportunity to do more in this area, not only to evaluate the only, our own products and services that we make available to Michigan schools, but other models that are out there. 
The second major area is the Center for Online Learning Research and Innovation. And again, this is not the complete list of things that the center is being directed to do. But you can see the first one is a clearinghouse function. Uh, we need to secure and identify continually best practices and share those with, with folks to help kind of move the needle. Uh, C there, producing an annual consumer awareness report uh, is another thing that we think can, can help move the needle. The, the second one that's listed there, uh, uh, we're going to actually engage in a pilot performance uh, based model where uh, a year from now, at the end of the school year that we just started, we'll randomly select a thousand of our online course enrollments and we only seek reimbursement on those that were actually successful and helped er earn credit uh, towards graduation for the students that we served in that pilot. So it is a relatively new thing for us. Uh, we're interested to find out what the results of that will yield. This next area uh, is focused around leadership. Um, we have over the years uh, made recommendations to the state board, to the governor, to the legislature, to the su state superintendent. But I'll draw your attention to B and C. I think we have three states now that actually have an endorsement related to online and blended learning. Michigan is a huge, as you all know, a huge teacher producing state. And yet we don't have a, an endorsement or a credential or something that would um, help prepare a pre-service candidate or even someone who's already teaching to get into that blended. And it is a different animal. I think Bruce did a good job of describing what this can look like. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of work to do to prepare today's teachers and tomorrow's teachers for this new world. Just an interesting side note that kind of tie bars to economic development in the state. I got a call from my counterpart in the state of Florida uh, two Saturdays ago. Just to put this in perspective, Michigan Virtual provided 24,000 enrollments last year, online course enrollments. Florida Virtual provided over 300,000 to the students in the state of Florida. They have a different policy framework than the one we have here in the state of Michigan, but, and I've known Julie for more than a decade. She called and said, Jamie, I have 4,000 students that are on a wait list for an online foreign language course. Help. Do you have any extra online instructors that I could contract to you for to fill that gap? So let's do the math. We produce, I think, 7,000 teachers a year in the state. The last number I saw is that we're employing about 2,500 of those a year. So we're an export producer of teachers. We've known that. We've done that for a long time. If more of those teachers were adequately prepared to teach in an online environment, we might actually let them live here in Michigan, build homes here in Michigan, and teach kids around the world. If we're truly thinking about a knowledge economy, it's a game changer, and it not only has impact on what we do as educators, it has impact on economic development for the future. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be recommending to uh, the state superintendent um, an endorsement, working with the department and the staff here, as well as teacher prep institutions around the state. C is very, very important. Um, we've opened up the floodgate on online learning. There's been a policy framework to open up uh, cyber schools. I think there's been an equal concern about how do we make sure some accountability so that we can have some assurance that taxpayer dollars are being used effectively. So we're going to be working with uh, the department, with stakeholders around the country. In fact, we've just been engaged in a project. One of our team members has been asked to uh, participate in a Gates project um, to look at um, identifying uh, best quality indicators for virtual schools and cyber schools. So uh, likely next summer we'll be in a position to make recommendations to the department in that area. The la next two slides I have uh, highlight the work that we're doing on behalf of the Snyder administration. We've been asked to engage in a strategic planning process to really figure out how do we fully harness the power of technology to drive more innovation into Michigan's educational system. So we've been spending the last couple of months uh, looking at uh, studies and reports and analyzing trends. We've commissioned public sector consultants and citizens research council. Uh, we're at the end of this month, we'll be getting into the stakeholder input process. We're going to be having a series of focus groups and interviews with policy leaders in Michigan, with educators, with teachers, with curriculum directors. Uh, and we're on target right now to present our findings and recommendations to the governor on December 12th, which is the date of our next online learning symposium at the campus of Michigan State University. And this next slide just simply is uh, illustrating uh, the items that we believe will likely be in this report. And some of these things the state board has already gone on record supporting this notion of uh, learning environments that are free of traditional time, place, and pace considerations. I should indicate, I meant to uh, say this earlier, um, with regards to the center, we've just uh, upgraded or promoted one of our employees, uh, Dr. Joe Friedhoff. And Joe is actually with us, He's standing in the back here. Uh, Joe is a former high school teacher, a recent doctoral student from Michigan State University um, who has a fairly significant command of research and is leading all of our research agenda, um, but also in the work that he did at MSU, became very, very familiar with different delivery models. 
So he'll be working with us significantly, leading the, the efforts within the center. Then I'd like to simply close with a quote. This is Bill Hewitt. Uh, he was famous for saying, innovation should not be easy, it should be possible. Um, and in the context of the work that we do, there is a, a learning delivery model that all of us would, I think, resonate to and say it makes perfect sense. We refer to it as open entry, open exit, allowing a student to move at the pace that is alignment with their capacity and their interest and their engagement. Just the idea of open entry, open exit wreaks havoc for any school administrator, any school board trying to work with a schedule and a calendar and a clock that's predefined. So a lot of well-intentioned people within the system are trying as hard as they can to do what's right with, with students. And I'll go back to the quote, the innovation shouldn't be easy, but it should be possible. And sometimes the system itself prevents us from doing some of the things that we want to do. For that, I'd like to turn it back to Sally. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Mike? You know, just to add on to my mic, Jamie, uh, I've been on the MVU board for about a dozen years through a few different positions, including this one, and I, I just want to say I think the partnership we have through the department with MVU has been great, and they have some, they have some excellent opportunities that I think uh, complement us well because kind of being a public-private uh, hybrid <laughs> in a different sense is it gives some advantages to MVU that we can't take advantage of as a, as a public institution but we can grow together on. And then secondly, you didn't know this obviously, Jamie, till last year when you had asked me to speak at one of your events and I went there and then gave the, my daughter a shout out who you didn't realize was one of your summer uh, teachers because she's a traditional teacher as you know. But uh, I think it's really good. I, I guess I missed that somewhere along the line, but I think it's good that you're going to be proposing some specifics about, uh, uh, you know, certification for online because she did struggle. She got some training through you, and she does it in the summer. You know, she, in fact, she, she not only does language instruction online in the summer now for her second year, but does it with uh, PLA schools, which is kind of a mission of hers. And, and she's learning, you know. I mean, it's not like this was easy, as you know, but I think it's, it, it's, it's really helped her in her traditional teaching. So, I mean, I would commend that to folks that may want to say, and I don't know how much you're recruiting or need traditional folks, but I know a lot of your, a lot of your online teacher of the year, I think, is also a traditional teacher, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. So that's becoming more and more common. Eileen, please. And thank you for uh, inviting us to put this on the agenda. I know you were one of the board members to do so. And of course, that's the perfect entree to my, my um, passion and pitch, which is that uh, I've talked briefly with Jamie, and certainly we're all aware of the difficulties we're having in, um, in acceptance of the importance of really high quality STEM education, uh, especially in 6 through 12. And um, this and technology lends itself so well since it's part of what STEM is all about to doing something more dramatic to bring science and math and technology and engineering alive for children across the state. This is such a, we have such a, an incredible history as a manufacturing state and I, the longer we delay in finding a really comprehensive way to help teachers and communities embrace this, um, the more likelihood there is that we're going to erode that base in a way that will not be state well. So, uh, that's my passion, and I'm not going to stop. <laughs> I have time now. I'm getting off of the governing board. So I'll be back. Thanks. Well, and Mike <coughs> disappeared, so I'll take the, the opportunity to ask my question, but I'll go to Nancy. Um, the, I mean, the, the issue, the opportunity, the concern with all of these different variants of how we use technology and online learning is, you know, are they contributing significantly uh, to increased learning outcomes and what's the quality of these. I think what you showed us is, is terrific and obviously there's some fantastic examples of how it can and is doing that in the different ways and you know, going to Richard's point, you know, things like the flipped high school seem like a wonderful example of taking advantage of the difference, the medium being the message, meaning it makes total sense to have the uh, uh, cool uh, lecture be delivered online and use the teacher's time to do the coaching, mentoring, problem solving, you know, as a way to take advantage of the different gifts of in-person and online. Um, the, the question I have, or two questions are, you know, how soon um, 
will it be, because you kind of alluded, we don't have really data yet to be able to um, assess objectively, you know, the flipped high school model appears to work, this cyber school is or is not performing, these kids taking these online courses offered by these providers are or are not learning at, uh, uh, at, at the expectations we would want. Um, so, you know, how soon can we get our arms around the performance of these different strands or are they changing so fast that it will almost always be impossible? But, Jamie, you know, I have terrific respect for you and the organization. The one concern I had is fantastic if you all are uh, looking at analyzing the effectiveness of online learning and how do we evaluate this stuff. The only um, concern I hope you could talk to is if MBU is in some sense a historic uh, sort of booster of virtual learning, how can you be an objective um, critic that gives us data or is, are we going to have independent assessment of the educational performance of all of these different variants, particularly the ones I think people are most concerned about, a freebooting cyber school that teaches uh, kids totally online, offering its wares. We need to know when and how they are or not delivering the goods. There's a, uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. It felt like more than one question. but. Um, <laughs> It is a moving target, and what we're evaluating today will not be what we evaluate a year from now, just because things are changing that, that quickly. Um, I think one of the challenges that we face is the notion that um, there is this rapid cycle uh, change that's taking place. Um, the, the early research that we have gotten, though, not just from what we do, but around the country, is that it works. So there, there's an old quote on the internet that being against online learning is, is like being against electricity. Well, we know electricity is an incredible tool that we use, but it can also be used to, to hurt people. And so to just universally say that all online learning is, is good for everyone, um, I got a letter uh, about two years ago from a parent whose uh, son uh, had a fairly uh, severe case of attention deficit disorder. And I think literally out of desperation, the school district said, let's put this kid in an online course. I don't think, I don't believe there was significant thought that went into the decision. The student ended up taking most of their coursework from home where they had access to a computer. He'd focus in for 10 or 15 minutes and then he'd start to drift. He'd shut off, he'd go listen to music, he'd go shoot hoops or whatnot. It was one of our more rigorous courses. He did very, very well. The, the, the letter that we got from the mother was, oh, oh my God, I knew I had a son who had capacity to do this work. He was just trapped in a, in a learning environment that, that was bad for him. Um, I can't hang up and, and, and say, okay, well, we just read this letter. Now we've got to go find every kid who has attention deficit disorder and, and say that online learning. So it's the applicability to the findings that we have. And I think it's really trying to, it's trying to figure out that fit because some students can do really well in an environment that needs very little instructional guidance and direction. Uh, other students need significant interaction, whether that's face-to-face -face or online or using the tools that mimic face-to-face. -face. Um, the, the, I think the last part of your question is how do we evaluate ourselves when we are a provider ourselves? And, and Joe may want to reference this as well, but we have a network of researchers that we collaborate with all over the country, and the plan is to leverage those folks so that, that we can avoid some of that uh, transparency issue that I think you alerted to, John. And you know, if I might add to that, I think one of the advantages of the board makeup that you have, which includes me in this role, included me in a prior role, I say this constructively, but I, I need to think how I word it. I mean, a lot of well, in my prior role, I was a resistor to some of this because I was concerned about what it might mean for members that I worked with. And I shouldn't say resistor, I mean I was cautious. So I think there's a, a natural, um, at board meetings, there's almost a natural um, bias that is, how can I say this, is, is, it keeps you honest is, is the way to put, put this, and I mean that respectfully. That conservative bias. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a bias towards, to some degree, towards the existing system. And as we learn about new things, so I mean, I, that's, that's one issue. The other thing, this is something we struggle with each day. Allison had an example yesterday. I, I can't tell you how many times I get personal letters, and you probably do too, that is hard, are hard to answer because it's 
it's trying to deal with the fact that we really don't have, we're a local control state. And so why aren't you doing this or why aren't we doing that? And the bottom line is that's up to local boards and locals. But you feel, here's our, my answer that I've gotten down to more clearly, and I think it will hold up with what John's, the spirit of John's question is. We are the accountability people, though, and we do measure it very well. And if something's not working, we're going to know. We being? We being the department, this board, this, this whole. So in the fact that we can't and shouldn't really be at a point where there's, there's 100,000 classrooms out there. I mean, there's professionals in each of those classrooms. They should be allowed, especially now under this kind of stringent accountability that they're held to, to do it the way they want to and the way they're trained, and yet get growth in our kids' achievement. So I think to the degree that, you know, I know you long enough that, you know, what do they say, trust but verify, uh, that, that, you're, that with your own special interests in this, to John's point, that you, there's a point where if you did skew this, it's going to become self-evident because the results are going to be shown through our department that these results aren't happening with either the pilots or some of those other things that are going on. Nancy, Nancy was next, and then Marianne, and then I one of the Thanks, John. Issues that you brought up here that I think we have yet to really uh, well, maybe we'll never completely, but more completely address as a state is that of capacity. Um, I was part of a, I was fortunate enough to be part of a grant, I think it was in 2002-2003, if I remember correctly, Jamie, you would do. No, it was long before that. Was it before that? Okay, <laughs> time flies. Time flies. But we had a four-pronged approach, much like what we've seen up here, but it was in that generation. And the mountains that we felt we were trying to climb in this, in, in, and actually in a very short period of time, really, have changed so dramatically. Um, the team that I worked on was with capacity building. And capacity building at that time was trying to figure out if we had a plug significant enough to plug a unit in. And could we carry this router and, well, we didn't even have routers server, can we carry that in or do we have to get a forklift to bring it in? I mean, it's just so amazing the difference that has come so quickly. But I still see what we're doing is talking about what we can't do, and I'm not saying you necessarily, but I mean in local districts, I still hear and I still witness people talking about what they can't do rather than what they can do. And if we're going to lift capacity, it seems to me that we need to start thinking in terms of what we can do not what we can't do because we have so much available to us now and so much capacity within reach even if it's the burn phone that some child brings into school there's still something we can do with that and we have to open our minds as leaders both at, at this level at the regional level at the local district level as communities to what we can do not what we can't do. And so I was thrilled when I saw the things that you demonstrated here to us, the examples of what we can do. And I guess if I, if I could do nothing else, I would um, urge all of our local leaders, our teachers, our parents to start thinking in that realm of what we can do. Um, I can remember when we did some of our interviews in capacity um, uh, a local superintendent who's no longer there, so I guess I can I can say that the district in, in uh, Leslie, uh, we were trying to figure out what it is that created capacity in districts, and we went out and did research all across the state to do that. And one of the questions I asked him, because he had two computers in each classroom, and he was really avant-garde, you know, two computers in each classroom. I said, how did you come up with the number two? Why not one or five or ten or, you know, what was special about two? He said, I had one to begin with, and the teacher used it only. And I realized if I put two in the classroom that she couldn't use both at the same time, so one of them had to be to the student. And I think that that's kind of the, the learning curve that we've kind of gone through. But those were the capacity issues that we dealt with then. The one that I still see within your presentation that I'm curious about is, you talk, and I don't know if I can pull up the sheet real quick, but you talk about capacity issues that the five, I think it was five, four, three, two, one, here it is. 
unfettered access to the internet through mobile devices, I still see as one of the capacity issues that we have as um, the, the clarity of access to these mobile devices and the internet within given buildings. You walk in some buildings, you have, inter you have such clear, uh, solid uh, access, uh, connectivity is there at the highest bar level you can get. You walk into other buildings and as you walk around the building you either have no access or you have one bar and suddenly in one spot if you stand by the window at the right way in the right time and hold your mouth right, you might get five bars. Well, how are we, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? What do you, how do we go to this unfettered access to the internet through mobile devices if that's the case of our infrastructure? Well, we are very far away from having five bars in every school in Michigan, right? And that's cellular. You, you but want to clarify that, right? right. We're going <laughs> to... <laughs> we are very, very far away from service five bars. bars but service bars. bars. Right, okay. but if that's a goal, right. how are we going to address that? Well, fortunately, the legislature has provided funds. There's about $50 million, or well, there's $50 million for technology infrastructure grants, and we will be proposing in the next couple months criteria to the board um, for those grants. And the focus will be on helping all schools uh, improve their technology infrastructure. And we are very close to being able to um, knit together or interconnect our school networks that previously exist. All, most or all schools are actually connected. The question is, do they have enough bandwidth um, and, and uh, what is the cost in that particular region? Uh, what people don't really realize is that Merit, one of the larger um, providers of um, internet backbone or backhaul, the large pipes across the internet, by next July they will have installed $130 million of large fiber that runs wow. all over the state and another um, organization received it to cover the thumb. So we'll have the, the highway, the super highway in, in place in Michigan, two, um, two bands across even the, uh, the, the upper peninsula. So I mean, we're going to be covered from a backhaul large highway, it's that interconnecting, kind of like our, our surface streets kind of interconnect our schools right now. And we're going to be looking for ways through that grant to, to really put an emphasis on that. You know, it's interesting. I, I can remember at the, about that same time, and this, I'm sure Jamie will remember this gentleman too, some of you hear me about him too, Elliot Soloway at the University of Michigan uh, was a big, big proponent of taking, um, and I'm, I'm trying to remember what he called his initiative and it's not coming to me so we'll move on um, but at any rate it was taking like we have like our blackberries now they weren't blackberries then but um, and he wanted he did a, a couple of uh, test pilots in, in Detroit where he gave every child one of these and people were appalled they were they were how can you do that these kids mm -hmm. won't take care of them they'll lose them they'll sell them for something else they'll get the latest tennis shoes they'll do whatever and in fact, what he found out, as you have found out, and this was a long time ago, that in fact those kids were so proud of those devices and so proud of being able to have a way that they were comfortable with learning that they took care of them. And when they asked how many of you learned, I think they had, I don't know, Jimmy, if you remember how many, but they had like 500 of these devices out in this test pilot. And they said, well, how many of them have you lost? And he said, none. So they're all working? Well, no, we've had two that have broken, we've had to replace, but we've lost none. I think that's kind of the message we need to get across, too, to our local districts and parents and schools, much like the woman you saw in here that said, at first when we heard about this, by God, this can't be right, we're going to go and solve this. And then as they got involved in it, they were very much like, oh my gosh, you're be here to see it. Elliot Soloway found that out over a decade ago. So we need to kind of embrace that as well. So I thank you for the hard work you're doing here. I wish I could wave a wand over it and have it done, but we can't, so um, we'll take it as we can. But please, please push forward. And please, if I can in, encourage you to do nothing else, create a road show. Let's take it out to people. Let's not wait like we traditionally do for people to come to us. I think we need to go out and inoculate <coughs> all of our districts and all of our leaders to help them to accept the possibility that exists here and start thinking differently now. So thank you. Thank you, Marianne and Richard and Eileen. Um, I'd like to thank Kathy. you all very much for all you've done in this presentation. Um, and I think 
think I probably echo a lot of my colleagues <coughs> when I say I frequently feel like an observer on all of this, and it's just screaming by so quickly. Um, oh, thank you. Um, and I, that leads to uh, my other concern. If, if we're feeling this way, what must uh, teachers in the classroom be feeling, and and what what can we do? Um, I, I hear what you're saying, Jamie, about um, uh, having a particular endorsement for teachers coming up. But what do we do for the teachers in the classroom now? How do we? help them. I mean, a lot of them must be feeling this way as well. It's a, it's a huge challenge. There's not a simple answer. I spoke with a, a nationally recognized expert in this area last week and he said, unfortunately, if you take the average teacher and you show them the neat things that can be done to uh, engage kids and to uh, <coughs> use assessment data, all the, all the things that we believe technology can do, um, the average response is, I, I don't know how to do that. I haven't been trained how to do that. And if that's my new set of expectations as the, you know, as the employee, I, I have concerns about job security. And so this really exciting, powerful vision becomes, for some, for many, an unpleasant thing. And we have to figure out. And I, I don't have the answer. I think it's just doing more uh, in service and, and working with our teacher prep institutions. Technology is not going to go away. The expectation that educators can use these tools and use them efficiently and effectively and ultimately demonstrate student achievement gains is, is where we're headed. Mm -hmm. And we've got to plan for and prepare for that. And we've, we've made progress. We've made huge progress, but the mountain is, is pretty big. And I can add to that, I think, Marianne, mm -hmm. to that question, that if you look at even the videos that Bruce shared today, the more that we can have teachers see other regular teachers in the best sense who become excited about this and, and, and embraced it, I think it builds confidence. I know with my daughter Krista, as we mentioned, we talked earlier this morning, about, but some of it's just doing it. It's like riding a, you start to ride a bike, you can ride a bike. But there is a confidence issue, and you, I think Jamie captured it well, that if we're not, this can become a negative for some, but these videos alone, to the degree, maybe in the spirit of what Nancy said, we go out. We can go out certainly with technology to all 100,000 teachers pretty much today. We're getting closer to that. Um, that's one answer, but I, I know I'm a broken record on this. It, it's also about teacher prep now. Mm -hmm. 3,500 in the pipeline, 7,000 <laughs> in the pipeline, but 3,500 that are going to be hired every year here pretty much for years to come, and we can really make a difference right out of the box. Yeah. A slide that I skipped. Um, shows that there was 29 new iPad initiatives since the Ludington teachers started and we started giving them you know, the positive focus that we, we did. And of, of course it's not about the device, it's about personalized individual instruction that the teachers now equipped. They had to build their own capacity. It's true. They, and, and they're helping others. There's been my, you know, pilgrimages up to Ludington to see what they're doing, but that's why, say, local Grand Ledge is offering every kindergartner coming in an iPad, and they're going to take it with them all the way up because they're like, if they can do it in Ludington, we have a technology bond in, in, in Grand Ledge, and we can do it too. Right. So, Did you have a follow-up, Marianne? No, I just wanted to reiterate what Jamie said about providing new service. Mm -hmm. And um, there is uh, I think one day you were talking about at a previous meeting um, about providing more in service. Maybe we can um, be sure to encourage that. You'll note that number three in the plan up there mm -hmm. is increased educator capacity and that requires us to do something to help the teachers be ready. Mm -hmm. We realize that's a, a foundational piece of all of this work. Mm -hmm. we, we also see that as infrastructure. So when you look at infrastructure, you're dealing with hardware, <coughs> software, and human resources. Thank you. Richard, Eileen, Kath, Bobby Joe. Um, I was inspired by uh, Nancy's comment. Let's focus on what we can do rather than what we can And it occurred to me that, you know, um, when Henry Ford uh, came up with the Ford Subtractor, 
He didn't go around to the farmers and preach to them about this is the automotive age and look at how <coughs> things are going to change and you've got to get, uh, get up with automotives and stuff like that. Instead, he took a Fordson tractor and he showed how farmers could more efficiently do the tasks around the farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is how technology is going to help our classrooms and get buy-in from teachers not buy these impressive things that tells us how kids are thinking differently, which I think is just BS anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, no, it all comes from Apple, Apple's marketing scheme. Uh, so so let's, not, let's see through the fall. Uh, but there are real tangible benefits from specific programs and tools, and if you present these, uh, then you will get much more buy-in from teachers, and uh, I'm a teacher myself, so I guess that shows my bias in you know, my approach to this. Um, I could give you I could give you a razzle dazzle presentation on carpentry and 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 show you uh, 16 tools, and you you go up, you go away impressed with how important carpentry is. How I can never manage all those tools, or I could show you how to use one tool to do a task you couldn't do before, and then. You know which which is the more desirable outcome. I, I think the latter is less impressive, maybe, uh, but but more useful. And and that's the kind of approach I'd like us to see take to technology and education. Good advice, yep. Eileen. Please, Kathy. Well, I want to add my kudos and my thanks to everything that's been done so far, and then I need to crack a whip. Um, <laughs> that's the way I am. Uh, uh, we know that uh, there's about 103,000 teachers in Michigan right now. Jamie, you just retrained or trained ten, uh, one, about a thousand, which only leaves us 102,000. Of that 102,000, 103,000, probably something between 10 and 30 percent are okay with this. Uh, could use tweaking, but there are leaders, and they'll be able to move ahead without us intervening at the <coughs> state level or their districts intervening substantially. Would that be fair to say? So that only leaves us with about 75 to 85,000 teachers who are going to be confronted with common core assessments in a very short time. And what I would challenge uh, the department and unfortunately uh, all of you, uh, sorry Jimmy, is to come up with a plan that we could talk about that allows us, we, all teachers have access to this kind of training at different speeds, there's different on ramps, that's the first thing I learned in education reform 20 years ago. You're going to have the people who are already in the classroom, the be leaders that I'm talking about right now, and perhaps are outcasts <coughs> as they are. Um, you're going to have other people who are ready to fiddle on this, and I don't know if that's 20,000 or 30,000, but I would think <coughs> in the next couple of years, the teachers who have stepped forward and say, okay, this is happening, I want to be on top of this. How are we going to make that demand? I know the districts can do things, but I don't know the difference between the quality of the training that you're providing and just the districts who are seeking new training and new providers. Uh, nobody, I don't know how many of them are going to want to invent the wheel on this, and um, if they don't, can you be a resource or other, other coursework, of course, is there other coursework that can be provided easily? And then figuring out how to do it, because I think to try to do this with less than 50 or 60 percent of the teachers ready to do it will be um, a very difficult thing to ask. And the other thing that I would also ask is, is I don't know how much uh, interaction there is right now between Jimmy and between MBU and the ed school. But I think that to put everybody on the same page, since he's an aftermarket trainer, uh, it just seems to me that it would be a very smart thing to show them what state of the art is or, or, or other course in addition to what you're doing. Uh, to, to say this is what we're having to do with teachers in the classroom, how much of this can be covered, and then really talk about what our role is with that. Uh, because I think, we, I think the moment is here, and if we miss it, we're going to play. Good point. Yeah, I have to vote for Cap toys and then Bobby Jones. Well, I want to thank you too. It's been very informative. I remember when a couple of legislators, I think it was the chairman of the Education Committee, it was about six or eight years ago, who proposed giving iPads to every kid. And they were booted out of the They were just ridiculed. I think it was such a far-fetched idea, and now it's coming and they just ahead of the time. People are tempted. But you talk about working more with the colleges and the teacher prep institutions, and I wonder what kind of reception are you getting? What kind of cooperation? How do they react to this? I, I will tell you, um, 
eight or nine, ten years ago, they were very quick and brief conversations if they took place. I spent three hours last week at one of our larger teacher prep institutions in the state meeting with one of our deans. Uh, we've established partnerships with three, and likely it will be four in the next couple of weeks, to give a practical opportunity for pre-service candidates to match up with some of our veteran online instructors so that they could observe and be part of um, learning about what online learning looks like as they go through their teacher prep program. So uh, just in the last six months, it feels like we've hit a tipping point with the level of interest that we have on the part of our teacher prep institutions. It's one of the challenges of the industry because to say you took an online course or that you provide online courses, some of us might think that an online course is an online course is an online course and that, that's just simply not the case. If you peel the onion back just a little bit, I went to a conference uh, about a year ago and uh, was interacting with some industry folks and uh, was talking to a, an executive from one of the online providers, happens to be connected to a university out west, um, and he actually taught a class online and he indicated that he had 600 students and it was four weeks into the semester he had not had one question from one of the students yet. I actually thought he was joking. Um, well come to find out this university staffs the online classes with what they call an academic help desk, largely college students. So if you as a student in that class have a question you go to that academic help desk using the technology tools to interact with the college student. And if that college student can't answer the question, then it goes to the, the real instructor. <coughs> so everyone has a student, a different student to teacher ratio, and everyone seems to have a different model. It's, it's not a direct comparing apples to apples. And so that's one of the other challenges of evaluating all of this is the nuances that exist. And uh, I'm not aware of uh, the student to teacher ratio uh, mandates that exist for the cyber schools. I, and I, to be honest with you, I don't know what their, their staffing models are. Should we be setting some criteria? We, we have, we have, they're held to the same accountability that all other 4,000 schools are through us. Well, they're held to the, but that's after the fact. As well, it is for... When they're, you know, when they're actually online, is there somebody they can turn to? Or is there somebody who requires it? That they're actually doing the work and it's not their parent? Or somebody else? But how do we... How are we going to handle that? Yeah. I mean, these are concerns. I mean, earlier when I was saying I can't quite envision the, the kindergarten online, I certainly didn't mean the Luddington piece I, where it's not, a, you know, the real teachers. I meant fully online. I think there's a lot of questions, Kath, and that's one reason we're opening this today. We're, if you think about it, we're going to look back in probably less than 10 years, but certainly in 10 years and say this was pioneer days. This was transition. This is when we were trying to understand better all of the things you're bringing up. And it's, it's exciting and frightening. It's both. And I think the best we can do for now is at least in our role at the department is make sure on the accountability side that to your point about the private folks that are getting involved in cyber schools, are they getting the student achievement gains that they're required to get? Otherwise, they become a priority, <coughs> formerly persistently lost achieving school, just like everyone else that doesn't meet it. But I get your point about the current. I think we should be looking at that as a challenge, along with all the things that are happening in the world. Regular school districts and regular schools. This whole new cyber school, I think, has some real challenges. And I don't want to see people, you know, just signing up students willy-nilly because they have more money. 
to that point and, and then Mayor Bobby John. I, I, I think that exactly this presentation is what will set the larger framework for conversation about uh, distance learning access. Mm -hmm. I think that if we can find a way to support teachers in the classroom to move common core to uh, implementation with trained teachers who are um, stepping backwards and wondering why we're doing this, that will create an environment in which the discussion will be uh, uh, more informed. And I think that that's where we have to go with as much speed as we can. <coughs> Bobby Joe, please. Mm -hmm. It's a concern. It's a big concern. You got it. And I, and I, it, I mean, I would just add to that a little bit that when we have these deeper discussions in the department than we can have in a, you know, in the brevity of a meeting. We're cautious about these new things that are being invented because we're not sure if we understand them. We're equally concerned about traditional schools that not one kid is proficient in math or reading. So I mean, I think our accountability system, which is starting to pinpoint this, and you know, we talked about this last meeting, but some of the controversy around focus schools, for example. I mean, there's a focus school in Oakland County where the superintendent, I'm, I'm last month very patient because I think it takes time to absorb this but a month later to still be well he has a high school where if you take the bottom 30 percent that's used in that not one kid is proficient in math so if your child is in that 30 percent in that high school you don't necessarily care what the overall school is score for that high school and I think what I'm getting at is I think that the value that our guys here are bringing to, the, to this discussion is being able to drive deeper into pockets where there isn't the kind of performance we would hope. And then I do need to say this, the overwhelming number of the folks that got the focus school calls were just saying, thank you for understanding this, thanks for giving us help on how to get out of this mess, but we just didn't know and now they do know and they're going to do something about it. But I, I, I think that's when we've had these deeper discussions, we think our role is to continue <coughs> to shine light and then provide help. And that's what Linda and Deb in particular are doing with the schools that have the biggest challenges and I think, you know, effectively. But I, uh, I've got five of jokes. Again, on behalf of a classroom teacher, I'm definitely seeing um, videos that you show there very exciting when you see the possibilities. But what a, one of the biggest complaints that I see as as teachers and, and, and for instance in our district and building is the chance to really take time to implement these and not just to implement them but the follow through and the support with them. A lot of times we get all this technology, we see the possibilities, it's so exciting, we get brief overviews of each of them and then it's like we want to delve deeper so we actually get a chance to, to take these apart and to work on each of them a little at a time and to actually take time to implement them, see their success, and then maybe get the support follow that we need. But as far, as far as I have seen, we're all on board, we're excited, it's just that time that we need to implement. Thank you. Well, this was great. I, uh, appreciate the opportunity to bring it. I hear some follow-ups that we'll do in our debrief later today that uh, were suggested. And um, I thank you guys a lot. And I appreciate the teamwork uh, that MVU and MDE has together that uh, I think was shaky, frankly, seven years ago. And it's not now. So I very much appreciate the party's uh, efforts together. And uh, with that, Thanks very much. Thank we'll move on to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. the next item. And I think John and I are going to set the stage a little bit for this ourselves. We're, we're going to be joined by the three deputies, Sally Vaughn, Carol Wollenberg, and Susan Broman. The three deputies. <laughs> I won't tell you what Susan has labeled us, including me. 